It's a year of action. Now, the word action, let's look at what it means. It means initiative and purposeful activity. Action doesn't mean just flying around by the seat of your pants, doing stuff, throwing things at the wall and hoping that something sticks. It's initiative, which means you get off your backside and you get to work. You don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. Whatever God's put on your heart, get after it. And it's purposeful activity. It's not just doing random things. It's not just trying a program because some other church did it and it worked there. It's not about just saying, okay, well, we're going to try this form of evangelism because there's a 10-step program that might work. No, friends, it's purposeful activity and initiative. What it means is this. We hear from God, we get up, and we do what He says with a purpose. That's what we're, this should be the church all the time, but friends, it's a reminder for today because this has been lacking in the church for far too long. The passage of Scripture that guides this, and this is where I was in prayer that day, and I am going to ask if you'd stand with me. We're just going to read a few verses from Matthew 9, 35 to 38, a passage that I'm sure several of you are familiar with. Um, it says in Matthew 9, starting in verse 35, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And when He saw the crowds, He had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then He said to His disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, speak to us today. I pray that 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 complacency and apathy and and all those things that we have had on us, those spirits that we have had on us, and we've allowed to take residence even inside of us, we say, get out now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that our physical bodies and our spirits would be renewed today at the Word that is presented to us. Not anything that I've come up with, but the truth of the Gospel that's presented. I pray would ignite a fire within each of us to go and shine the light of Jesus to the world around us. Speak to us today through Your Word. And I pray that this is the day we declare, not just pray, we declare in Jesus' name, this is the day where the page turns and this church steps into its destiny. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So a year of action. That's what we're moving into. We've talked about this year being a year of drawing closer, and, and, and that's been the emphasis really throughout 2022. How can we draw closer to the Lord? How can we draw closer in our marriage relationships, our relationships within the home? How can we connect with each other in the church body? Some of those things we've probably gotten right. Some of those things we maybe have not. But I'm telling you, we will continue to, to develop in those areas as we step into what the Lord has for us today. And as we talk about being people of action, there's something that jumps out to be in Matthew chapter 9. When you look specifically at what Jesus, uh, what is said about Jesus in verse 36. What was the response of Jesus when He saw the crowds? It says, He had compassion on them. Jesus saw the crowds that they were harassed and helpless. And Jesus had compassion on them. The word compassion means that He was moved to His innermost being. So it wasn't that Jesus just looked over at these people and thought, oh, those poor pitiful people. He was moved to His core, to His innermost being when He saw these people that were like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved so much so that He begins to speak to the disciples. Look at the harvest. It's plentiful. There's harvest everywhere. We need to pray that there will be more workers that will go into the harvest field. I got news for you. That's all of us. That's not one or two relegated to a platform. That's not a few people that are in the seats. If you're a child of God, you are a laborer. That's our responsibility. But friends, that responsibility and that passion can only be birthed from compassion. If you don't care, you won't do anything. That's what it boils down to. If you don't care, you will not act. And Jesus sees what's happening and He says He has compassion for the people. 
And so for us to be people who are moved into action, for us to be people of action, we need to emphasize a couple of things, a couple of areas where we need compassion. The first is we must have compassion for the lost. That's my first point. Now some of this is going to sound similar to what I preached last week. We must have compassion for the lost. You want me to be blunt? The American church really does not have that. We got people that we work next to. We have people that live in our homes that don't know Jesus, and we could not act like if we cared any less than what we do. Family members, loved ones, people that you're going to see this week when you go to your various family functions to eat turkey or ham or whatever your pleasure. Some people, I heard lasagna. It's like, well, it's not Thanksgiving, but your family can just do you, all right? (laughs) Give me the turkey and let me take a nap while the football game's on. Somebody felt God on that. (laughs) Let me get back on the wagon here. We must have compassion for the lost. You know what I've found, especially in the American church? Because this is the culture that we live in. One word. We debate everything. Everything's a debate. Turn on news. What are they doing? You get two talking heads that have differing opinions and they argue with each other. You turn on sports networks, and all you do is you get one guy that thinks this dude's the goat, and you have another one who thinks he's terrible, and what do they do? They sit and they yell at each other about it. People make careers off of debate. And you know what's happened? That not only is, is uh, uh, built up and encouraged in the media, it happens in everyday life. All you have to do is get on social media. You see people that debate about all kinds of things. And the problem that I see is that mindset has infiltrated its way into the body of Christ when it comes to our relationships with those who don't know Jesus and our interactions with those who don't know Jesus. Friends, i got to tell you something right now. If you're more worried about winning a debate with someone who's lost than you are leading them to Jesus, there's a problem. Because at the end of the day, we should know we're right because we have the gospel. There is no, I need to win. You already know that you win. That's not the point. You're not trying to win debates. You're trying to win souls. That's what this is about. We have to understand that that happens. When we're focused, we're so focused on proving people wrong that we can't lead them to what's right. Friends, we've lost our way. Yes, tell people the truth. But what happens is, especially something I've seen many, many times, we speak the truth, but we have to speak it in love. If I walk up to somebody in this room and I say, you're going to hell because you don't know Jesus, is that truth? Yes, if they don't know Jesus, that's their destination. It's where they're headed right now. But what have I done? I have immediately put up a wall. I have immediate Now, if the Holy Spirit... There will be times, but I'll just let, let me break this. It's going to be rare. There may be a, an opportunity. There may be a moment, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit says, that's the way you need to present it to this person. But most of the time, that's not going to be the way it is. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. Friends, we, <laughs> I think it really comes down to perspective. How do we see the lost? Do we see them as what they are? Lost? Because in the natural sense, when you see someone as lost, if you're any sort of a kind and decent human being at all, your desire is to take that person who's lost and show them the way. Where is that compassion in the church? I'll say it again. We're not trying to win debates. We're trying to win people to Jesus. You look in in Luke chapter 15, there are three parables about lost things. right? There's the lost sheep, there's the lost coin, and then there's the prodigal son. And we're going to briefly touch on all three of those passages. The lost sheep in Luke 15, 4 through 7 says it this way. It says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? There's a pause moment. Not just, let me stick my head out the window. Oh, don't see it. Sorry. Close the window and go back to my regular business says he goes and he looks for that sheep until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Not just telling the sheep, hey, this is the way and walking away. It says, 
picks it up, puts it on his shoulders, and carries it back home, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, or in the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, more joy. In heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There's a party in heaven when a lost person comes home. Amen? Let's keep going. The lost coin. The same chapter. The very next few verses, 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently how long until she finds it? Tenacity. I can tell you right now, I'll stop and then I'll keep going. There are some of you, you would have more tenacity looking for a lost $100 bill than you would try to find a way to lead your lost husband to Jesus. Friends, that's a problem. Does that mean you got to take your Bible and smack that lost husband over the head every day? No. But does that mean you need to show that lost husband Jesus every opportunity that's given? Yes. We look until we find. Verse 9. And when she has found it, what does she do? Same thing. Calls together her friends and her neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over how many sinners who repent? Just one. Just one. Just one. One person that doesn't know Jesus. When they repent, the Holy Spirit convicts them of their sin. And they repent and they come to salvation in Christ. Heaven throws a party. You want to know what that party looks like? There's one more parable in that same chapter. Luke 15, it also talks about the prodigal son. Now I'm not going to read the whole portion of Scripture, but let me give you the background that leads up to the passage I'm going to read. This prodigal son just demands his inheritance. He says, Dad, I'm young. I know you're not dead yet. Because inheritance is supposed to be something you get when the person above you dies, right? The older one. Who are, that's, when there's an inheritance left, it's usually somebody's passed away. The son goes to his dad and says, Dad, I don't care that you're not dead yet. I want my money. I want it now. And I'm going to go do what I want to do. That's exactly what happens. That's the Aaron version of what happens in that passage. I don't care that you're dead, Dad. Or I don't care that you're alive, Dad. I, don't, I, I, I wish you were dead. Just give me the money. I don't care. I'm out of here. So the son takes this money, he squanders it all in reckless and sinful living, and he finally gets to such a low place. He gets to such a low place that he says, you know what, I might as well just go back to my dad's house. But his mentality is, I'm just going to go back to dad's because at least I know my dad treats hired hands halfway decent. I'm not going to go back to my dad and say I'm going to be his son. I already ruined that. But I'm going to go back to my dad and I'll be one of his servants. At least I'll have provision. But I want you to watch what happens when that prodigal son who was lost comes back to dad's house. 17 to 24 in Luke 15 says this, But when this son came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. Man, look at the heart of the father. But while he was still a long way off, the son didn't even get an opportunity to start his spiel yet. Are you listening? The son didn't even get a chance to beg and plead his dad. He had his story put together. I'm going to go to my dad and say, Dad, I don't even deserve. He's going to say, Dad, I don't even deserve to be your son, but just let me work in your house and, and I'll just be a servant. He didn't even get the opportunity to beg. It says when his dad saw him far off, a long way away, it says his father saw him and felt what? Compassion. His father was moved to the core that he saw his boy again. And he ran. This is dad. He ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And and this is the vision, this is the picture I get mentally in my head of this situation. Dad runs to his son and he grabs him and he kisses him and he hugs him and the son starts to spill. Dad, I've messed up. I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I can see dad just letting that go one in one ear and out the other one. He's not even listening to what's being said. 
The son's groveling and doing his little, oh, dad, I don't deserve it. And dad's just like, yeah, 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 whatever. He looks at his servants and he says, boys, bring quickly the best robe that we have and put it on my boy. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattest cow we've got and kill it because we're partying tonight. Because my son that was dead is alive again. He was lost, but he's found. And what happened? That one son that ran away, came back home. Yet again, here it is. Once what was lost is found, there's a party going on. So here's something that I want us to grab a hold of because that's a common thread here in all of those. There's heavy compassion. There's a desire. You're moved. The first one, the sheep, I'm moved because my sheep is lost. i got to grab it. i got to go find that sheep. I'm moved to my innermost being. I need that sheep. i got to go get it. The money, when I think a lot of people would relate to, I lost a good chunk of money. Like, i got to go find it. We're moved. <laughs> This one's a little different in the context that dad didn't have to go looking for the son. The son showed up at his doorstep, but he was still moved with compassion. That dad, in earthly terms, we could have been like, you know, he could have been like, you know what, you're right. You really did me wrong, son. You did me dirty. And you know what, to earn my love again, I will make you a hired servant. And you can prove yourself to me and then maybe, just maybe, you can be my son again. That's not what the father did. As soon as he saw his boy, and my favorite part is it says, while he was still a long way off, he barely starts to get the image of his son coming a little clearer as he's moving closer. And he, he leaves everything he's got and he runs out and goes to get him. That's my boy. I'm going to go get him. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how stupid you've been. I don't care how much of my money you've wasted. I don't care how rude and mean and inconsiderate you were to me when you took your inheritance early. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters to me is that you're home. And there's a party that happens. You know what I find interesting in the charismatic and Pentecostal movement? Everybody's looking for something emotional, something uplifting and encouraging. How could there be anything more encouraging and uplifting and more riotous party-like than seeing somebody come to Jesus? Friends, that's what this is all about. You know, we love to talk about in Acts chapter 2. You've been in this church long enough. You've heard me preach it a zillion times. Acts 2, 42, we love, and through 47, we love to talk about in their midst, there were signs and wonders and miracles and all this awesome stuff. At the end of that passage, says, and they added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's not just something where we come in here, we get filled up and we go out and do nothing. We're filled up for a purpose. We're equipped for a purpose, and it's to go and to be a light to the lost. We have to have compassion. If John 14.6 tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through Him, then why are we not showing people the way? Why are we not showing people the way? So I have a few questions to consider. First, if people around you that don't know Jesus, if there are people that don't know Jesus that are around you, and newsflash, that's all of us, do they know that you belong to Jesus? Through the way you live and through the way you talk. Let me be a little more specific. Those people that don't know Jesus, do they know that you know Jesus because you've told them about Him? Do we take the opportunities that we have to share the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And do we have any compassion in our hearts to care about the fact that we have people all around us that are destined for eternity, separated from God, Do we have any compassion in our hearts to do something about it? If we want to be people of action, we have to be compassionate people. We have to have that compassion for the lost. That's going to require some of you to be more bold than you've ever been in your entire life. Suck it up and let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. Why not have people get saved? Why not have somebody get saved today? Huh? 
Why not just look around the room? I don't know where some of you are at in your relationship with Jesus. I, you maybe have done... Here you go. Let me give you a little example. Maybe you have gone so far in your life that you feel like that prodigal son. I've screwed up too much. I've said too many things. I've burned too many bridges. All the Father is saying before you even walk out of this building today, just come back home. I'm here. I still love you. Yeah, you messed up big time. I watched every bit of it happen. I saw it. Lots of poor choices. And I'm not promising you that your life's going to be easy. I'm not promising you that, 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 that anything's going to get better in a natural sense. But what I'm promising you is that you won't have to go through any of it alone anymore. If you need somebody with you, i got great news for you. There's somebody named Jesus that loves you, that cares about you. And all He says is come back home. And I can promise that you'll grow in that process. You're going to have to repent of your sins. He's not your friend that you can just go do whatever you want to do and then pull Him out whenever you want Him. It's a relationship. But it's the best relationship you ever have, I promise. And I cannot talk about being people of action and compassion without talking about the second thing. Yeah, we need to have compassion for the lost, but we also need to have compassion for one another. Romans 12, 9-13 says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor or hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now I'm going to reread through that, but I'm going to reread it in the form of questions. These are moments, of, it's a moment of self reflection for all of us, okay? So I don't want you to answer out loud, but I'm going to ask some questions. And I'm going to give a very small pause, and I want you to ask yourself that question. I'm going to do the same thing. I've already done it in preparation of the message, but I'll do it again right now. Let's look at this passage again. Go back to verse 9. It's not going to read exactly the same because I'm asking in the form of questions, but here we go. Is my love for others genuine? Do I really love people? Do I have compassion for them? Do I hate what is evil? And do I really hold on tightly to what's good? The next verse. Do I love those around me with a real brotherly affection as if they were family to me? Do I have it in my heart to show others more honor than what I want them to give me? Am I more willing to give them honor than I am to receive it, is what I'm saying. That's what Outdo one another in showing honor. That's not easy, but that's the call. Verse 11, Have I become slow and sleepy in my zeal for the things of God? Do I rejoice, in verse 12, do I rejoice with hope that's only given to me in Jesus? Am I patient when I'm going through stuff? Do I pray consistently? Do I contribute to the needs of those in the church as I see them? Do I care about my brothers and sisters enough to show them hospitality and to take care of even their physical needs if that's what the situation calls for? Friends, this... Because here's the deal... We can talk about gifts of the Spirit. We can talk about all that kind of stuff. This passage, this is supposed to be the lifestyle of the believer. I'm not saying you can do some of these. I'm saying we should do all this. I'm not saying you can cherry pick and say, this is what I like and this is what I don't like. I'm saying this is the Word and we got to do all of it. We are called to have genuine love. We're called to hate evil and hold on to what's good. We're called to love each other with brotherly affection. We're called to have such a culture of honor in this house and in our relationships that my goal becomes I'm going to honor you, not in a competitive way, but in a heart of love. I'm going to honor you more than I want you to honor me. I'm not going to slow down in my zeal for the things of God. I'm going to be fervent in the Spirit. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to rejoice with the hope I have in Jesus. I'm going to be patient when I'm walking through things. And I'm going to pray and talk to the Lord all the time. And I'm going to contribute to the needs of those around me. Those in the house of God. I know these things aren't always easy to do. I'm not trying to stand here today and say, oh, well, just like, 
Why aren't we doing it? I mean, I am asking the question, why are we not doing it? But I'm not saying it with a flippant mindset, pretending that some of these things aren't a challenge sometimes, because they can be. Sometimes they are. Sometimes people in the church get on each other's nerves. I probably made some people mad Sunday in the middle of my message. I get it. I understand that. I'm sorry that I made you mad. I could have presented the package a little better. I understand that. But at the same time, like the mentality in too much of the church is when we get upset with each other, we either get offended or we take our ball and go somewhere else. It's not the way it's supposed to work. It's a spirit of offense. It's demonic is what it is. It's a spirit of offense. You let it get on your shoulders and in your life, you let it get in your heart, it'll ruin you. Nobody said hi to me today. Well, did you say hi to anybody else? These things aren't easy, but look at what's said in Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Why? For in due season we will reap if what? I got news for you. That's a conditional statement. That word if means that's a conditional statement. You will reap in due season if you don't give up. But guess what happens if you give up? You will not reap. How many harvests, and I'll go back to that just for a second, how many harvests in verse 9, how many have we missed because we gave up too soon? How many harvests in healthy relationships have we missed because we gave up too soon? How many harvests in blessing, financially even, in relationships, in ministry, how many blessings have we missed because we gave up before the harvest came? Storms show up. Things that threaten the crops are going to happen. Ask any person that works in the agricultural area. They will tell you they have to deal with weather. They have to deal with rodents and all kinds of pests. They have to deal with all kinds of stuff. But they stay the course. Why? Because they know that there's a season waiting for them just on the other side that if they stay the course, there'll be a harvest. Friends, the encouragement is the same for us. So then, it says, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. So then, as we have opportunity. So because of that, if we stay the course, if we continue, if we do not give up, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. But look at this word, especially. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Do good to everyone, but especially your brothers and sisters. That's what that says. Yeah, sister so-and-so that said that mean thing about you that got you all upset. You're supposed to do good to her. (laughs) Hey, pastor so-and-so that said something that might have hurt you Sunday that you didn't like. You're supposed to do good to me. Guess what? I'm supposed to do good to you too. I'm not trying to be self-serving. There's reciprocity, right? There's that we give to one another. We outdo one another in showing honor. Friends, this has got to be the way of the church. That's got to be the way of this church. Compassion for each other compels us to action in a way that the only thing that matters to us is that we honor God and we honor one another. See, because really when I'm talking about we need to have compassion for each other, it comes down to growing in a heart of selflessness for each other. I'm going to read quickly two passages of Scripture. I'm getting somewhat close to closing, I'll put it that way. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says it this way. Do nothing. Say nothing. Nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. In my words, treat people as if they matter to you more than you matter to you. Should we depreciate our own self-worth? No, that's another discussion for another day. But if the Bible tells us the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, Paul takes it a step further here and he says, don't just love your neighbor as yourself. Give them more honor. Consider them more significant than yourself. What does that mean? That's great that you're taking care of your own needs, but do you see someone in your midst who has needs? If you do, why are you doing nothing to help? Verse 4, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The things that we do should never be with selfish motives is what I'm trying to say. But we need to have humility in our hearts to consider the needs of others. 
Even when we talk about people operating in various gifts, 1 Peter 4, 7-11 through 11 says this, The end of all things is at hand. How many of you know that with every breath we have, we're getting closer to Jesus coming back? Well, that's our blessed hope as a believer. Now, if you don't know Jesus, that can change today. And this is not a hope for you. That should scare you. And Jesus is coming back. But once you come to know Jesus, it's the most exciting thing you could hear. Jesus is coming back at any moment. And I just... Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, because of that, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. He's talking to believers, brothers and sisters in the faith. Above everything else, Peter says, love each other. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. So that dumb thing you did that made me mad the other day, that really, I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I looked at one person, they were like, not, I'm not, no ulterior motives here, just general, generally speaking. That dumb thing you did the other day that made me really mad, that way that you maybe even sinned against me, yeah, it hurt. But we have to get to the place where we love like Jesus, where our love for others overcomes a multitude of any sin that might be in our midst. Now, what's our responsibility when we sin? One word, repent. But when others sin against us, we love. Are you with me? Verse 9, we should show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, what do we need it for? Or what do we use it for? We use it for the purpose of serving one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that... So we do it that way. Why? So that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Friends, the truth of the matter is, is when the church walks in humility, when the church walks with a heart of compassion, and those things compel us into action, that is what gives honor and glory to God in the sight of all people. You want to honor God? You want to give Him glory? Yes, do it with your voice during praise and worship. Yes, do it through your shout and your amen on a Sunday morning. But do it every day of your life by living biblical principles. And when people see the way you live, when people hear the way you talk, they will see that the God of the Bible is the God of your life. And they will see who He is and give Him glory for the good things that He's done. But it all comes back to compassion. For us to be people of action, there has to be compassion. Because if you don't care, you won't act. If you do not care, you will not act. Because the truth of the matter is what you care about is proven through your activity. What you're passionate about is proven through what you do. And you see that all the time. You see people who start their own businesses. They're passionate about it, so it it consumes their lives. I see people who are passionate about their kids and the, the lives of their kids. They make their kids an idol and they, that consumes their entire lives. They're passionate about their spouse. And listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any passion for your job. That you shouldn't have any passion for your wife or for your husband or for your kids. Like we should, right? But how many of those things have we put up as pride idols in our lives to say, look at my wife, look at my husband, look at my kids, look at my job, look at my car, look at my money, whatever. We have a lot more idols than we'd like to admit. We have way more idols than we'd like to to admit. Every person, myself included, can respond to these altars today and lay some idols down. I guarantee it. I'm not trying to be mean. It's It's just the truth. And the question is, what are those things? What are those things that get in the way of you serving the Lord with your whole heart? What are the things that get in the way? Because if you serve the Lord with your whole heart, you're going to serve other people with your whole heart too. The lost and your brothers and sisters. If you love Jesus with your whole heart, you're going to love others with your whole heart. Are you following me today? Yes. But it's compassion. Do we even care? Does it matter to us that there may be people here today that don't know Jesus? Does it matter to us that there may be people here today while we're planning our holiday vacations and our family get-togethers that they have nowhere to go, they have no one to talk to, and they're nothing but by themselves? 
Maybe they don't have enough money to even put food on their table for Thanksgiving this year. Do we even care? Jesus was moved in Matthew 9 by compassion. He sees the lost as helpless and harassed, like sheep without a shepherd. He sees them wandering. And I wonder what our hearts look like when we see people in the same condition. Maybe even those who are in our midst today. I look at, there's one more passage of Scripture that I have for this morning. And it's the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. This is after that happens. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He washes their feet. And then there's a passage in John 13, 12 to 17, where Jesus begins to speak to them. He says this to me, he says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Becoming people of action, saying that this is going to actually take place in this church in the year ahead of us, We have to be compelled by compassion and have a heart to serve. Action for the sake of busyness or action for the sake of pride means very little in the grand scheme of things because there won't be many results. When you do it just to do it, you know, the Word of God is not going to return void, so there'll still be some sort of a harvest when you present the gospel. But when you're just doing it because, well, pastor, preacher man told me to, and there's no compassion and no drive in it, There might be a little something that will come from it, but it might be a little better if you had the passion to go with it. If you're doing it for pride to let other people see how spiritual you are, pride goes before a fall. So if you want people to see how spiritual and awesome you are or what, what great ministry you've put together, you're already off on the wrong foot. Yeah, even a perfect example, how many preachers have fallen? We see it so many times. Now, a lot of people come to Jesus through those ministries, again, because the Word of God will not return void. So if you've seen a preacher fall and you don't understand why so many people would get saved and that guy could have been in that sin or that lady could have been in that sin for so long, well, I'll tell you why. Because the Word will not return void. And if God in the Old Testament can speak through a donkey, He can speak through anybody. Are you with me? But if you try to do things for pride... So people can see how awesome you are. Friends, it's not going to get you very far. But if we take action, and it's birthed from compassion with a servant's heart, that aligns us with the example of Jesus. If Jesus washed feet, even of the man who betrayed Him to be killed, then who are we to say we are above doing the same? The gospel has always and will always be about people. It will. It's not about getting people into a building just for the sake of statistics. Not just another feather in our cap to say we've done another building program or we've seen all these awesome things or look at this brand new ministry we've started. We're so awesome, aren't we? Friends, everything has to point people to Jesus and it has to be birthed from a compassion to understand that if Jesus has compassion for them, that should be our heart too.